Okay, we're ready. Hey everyone, I'd like to call your attention. We're gonna get the meeting started. That's okay. Good evening, everyone. This is my first official uh, time as chair, so thank you so much for allowing me this position. I'm Alex Ann, if you haven't met me before. Um, before we start the meeting, though, we would like to take a moment of silence to honor Mike McKillop. Uh, he added a lot of value and contribution to CWAP, and so um, let's just take that moment now. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'd like to start the meeting officially. And um, Joe, if you would help me start the introductions. Of course, thank you. So good evening, everyone. Joe Gall, Chief Utility Relations Officer. I'm channeling my inner Mark Jockers. Usually Mark is the one that doing, doing this uh, role. This is not forever. It's for a month or two. I'll talk about that later. So um, I'd like to uh, remind people that we are in a hybrid format. Uh, actually, we have a few more folks than normal uh, in the virtual mode tonight, and that the meeting is being recorded. So, before we start the meeting, we want to do introductions. So, let's start. I'm Jody Newcomer, technical director here. Joe Gall, Chief Utility Relations Officer. Alex Fan, Chair and District One Rep. Diane Paniguchi Dennis with Clean Water Services. Elaine Stewart, Environmental Rep. Ramesh Krishnamurti, District 2 Rep. Amy Hamgen, District 4 Rep. Mark Farah, Builder Developer Rep. Cheryl Magos, the City Rep. Let's go back to Stephanie. I'm Stephanie Morris in Clean Water Services. Chris White, Culture Equity and Learning Management. Shannon Huggins, uh, Community Engagement. I'm Bob Baumgartner with Regulatory Affairs. Amanda McGarry with Regulatory Affairs. Kathy McGarry, CFO. Steve Cho, Business Operations Strategy. Jack Allen, Chief Business Officer. Kathy Rivara, I'm the Learning Coordinator. Laura Ford, Practice Leader on the Spectrum Spectrum. I'm Chan Lee, I'm the Inner Director for Engineering and Water Technology. Okay, thank you. Stephanie, I think. You can introduce our virtual attendees. We do have some members of CWAC with us tonight virtually. Glenn? Yeah, hi, folks. Glenn Fee, Environment Rep. Matt? Um, Matt Wellner, one of the builder developer reps, and I apologize. I'm still struggling to get my video working. So at some point, I'll get it. I promise. Clean Water Services, we have Julia. Hi, Julia Crown, Regulatory Affairs, Clean Water Services. We do expect a few more virtual ventures to join us for Clean Water Services. They'll probably be popping on mid meeting. Right. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I'd like to make sure everyone's had a chance to review and accept the January 10 meeting. That's good. Do we need a motion for that? No, okay, not that signal. Okay. And next, we'd like to just jump into our first agenda, which is uh, long term regulatory compliance. So I'd like to introduce Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, with me is Laura uh, Porter and Rick Shanley. Steve Choke in the background is also here. I can uh, convince him to have a talking role, but he's doing a lot of the Work we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and uh, with us also is Julia remotely. And what we wanted to talk about is our long term regulatory plan that we are in the process of developing and probably will be developing it for a while. And do I own the slide clicker? And so, what I want to do is I'll provide some background. Julia. Uh, and Laura will talk about the process that we have been working through. Uh, Rick will identify how some of this planning interrelates both with what we have to plan for, for our own infrastructure, our own construction, and what we do for regulatory uh, compliance. 
And one of the messages I want you to come away with is that integration is incredibly important. Uh, and that's what's going to carry us into the next 40 years, uh, which is a long time, but that's how long our infrastructure lasts. And so we'll be touching on that uh, a little bit, and then I'll talk about the next steps as well. And so, you know, there's a number of good reasons why we are investing our time and effort into this long term strategy. One of them certainly is we are responsible for compliance and compliance with our permit, but it's much more important than compliance with our permit. By being in compliance with our permit, being able to demonstrate that we can achieve those regulations, that what gives us the uh, scope, the flexibility to be innovative. Being innovative is going to be credit incredibly important for us to meet our obligations to the public, you know, to uh, the public trust to wisely spend the public's money, not only on what we're building, but probably more important to make sure that we are getting the benefits that we want to achieve out of such uh, environmental regulations as the Clean Water Act. So that we spend our money wisely, we get the outcomes that we are looking for, and we create the, uh, the uh, type of infrastructure that we need going forward. Uh oh, did I mess you up? Perfect. And perfect? You are off camera. Oh, do I have to be on camera? Where do you want me to be? Oh, man. I like to wander around when I thought this is going to be really hard. So you'll have to forgive me in advance. Uh, but we are facing increasing regulations. Later on tonight, you'll hear a little bit about that with the PFOS and how tight those regulations are going to be. I looked at work uh, we did at Clean Water Services a decade ago, and for the PFOS parameters, we are uh, 1,000 times less than 10,000 times less, not only what we are measuring, but what we are going to be having to comply with. So our standards are getting tighter. We need to be able to be more flexible to achieve the outcomes we want. And having the data and information is going to be incredibly important for us because much more important than just coming into com maintaining compliance, we want to have the information ahead of time so we can influence those regulations. So we can start drawing that balance between what do we want to achieve and what do we have to build to get there. Uh, many of you don't know, I spent a, a lot of years at DEQ and still much the same. They want to have that opportunity to be thoughtful. They want to have that opportunity to be innovative. They are so spread thin uh, and so pushed on making sure compliance, they look to us to be able to provide those avenues of flexibility and avenues of opportunity. Because of that, uh, people who know me know I'm a raging incrementalist, so there will be cycles that we go through in this planning as we learn and move forward. Oh, there we go. So what I wanted to walk through real quickly is skip them. It's a couple of our permit efforts. We are normally on a permit every five years. It really is about every seven years or so. We get a new permit. That permit really guides us for the next seven years uh, that we will work on. Some of you will remember some of the discussions we had about a decade ago about our previous permit. With that permit, we really wanted to achieve a number of things. One of them is we wanted to make sure we were fully utilizing the infrastructure that we had built so that we didn't leave any stranded technology and that our investments were fully utilized that helped us keep our costs down. Uh, and we want to make sure we got that investment. We wanted to expand our approach for uh, the watershed approach. Uh, temperature training has been very effective for us. We wanted to expand those opportunities and look more broadly and start to link our watershed approach more closely with our stormwater program. We wanted to retain some of the flexibility we have in our permit. Our permit is very complex. The reason it's complex is it gives us a lot of flexibility for how we operate our plant to meet not only the standard, but to provide the appropriate type of treatment for the conditions. We operate a little differently in the winter when nutrients aren't so important 
than we do in the summer when new plants are important and we want to remove them. Uh, and we wanted to continue to improve water quality. We wanted to be able to adjust and manage the flow of the river as part of our strategy. And really important is we wanted to get some opportunity for the uh, discharges in the upper river. So we got opportunities for two new discharges in the upper river. Uh, those are the only two new discharges that the DQ has proved in my career, um, by the way. Oh, but that's what allowed us to have the natural, treat, treat, the natural treatment system at Forest Grove, which not only provides an excellent source of treatment, uh, but wide, great, uh, broad environmental improvements. We have the same opportunity, should we elect to do it, at Hillsborough as well. The permit we have now, if you've heard me speak before, is that we started to negotiate our next permit five years from now before we actually got this permit. It seems irrational, but things are changing so fast. And the other thing that we've got, got to come to grips with is we are doing that intentionally because this permit is really a uh, transition. It's transformative in our program. And we needed to start to work with DQ on uh, figuring out how we did that, how we got that done. We can't really just wait until 18 months before the permit is due and try to negotiate that with the DEQ. So we are trying to get ahead of the game, understand what we want to achieve, and work with the regulators to create a pathway for us to get there. There are a number of options for that. DEQ is really open to an integrated plan. I talked to them about that yesterday. We'll be working on implementing that plan with them, how to implement some of the regulations. Uh, we are optimizing our treatment uh, requirements. Uh, you'll hear about that in a little bit, but as these standards get tighter, we are finding they are often in conflict. What we do for nutrients is not the same thing that we'll do for aluminum. How we work through that is a very difficult exercise. That's going to be a national experience. But we're going to be leading the way. And so what we do will also influence what happens further than this. Updating the TMDL. Uh, which drives our nutrient criteria, something we need to do. That really is a regulation that describes when and how we remove nutrients at our plant. What was really interesting in the discussion we had with DEQ yesterday, the statewide exercise, they noted that they hadn't given this much thought that Clean Water Services has raised the awareness of all the TMDLs they are issuing they're going to need to have a process for how they review and update those in some sort of uh, manner that can be done effectively and efficiently. So again, we'll be working with DEQ to figure that out and to make that happen. We've been really innovative, innovative with stormwater, trying to really link the restoration and the stream enhancement that we do with starting to water. Stephanie gave me the stink eye because they got on camera. Uh, yeah. Could you explain what TMDL is a little bit for folks? Oh, sure. Uh, I do fall into acronyms and I apologize for that. There's a section of the Federal Clean Water Act that says here are these technology based limits that everybody has to achieve. For wastewater treatment plants, that's 30 milligrams per liter of suspended solids and 30 milligrams per liter of BOD. Then it goes on to say, if that does not achieve the in-stream water quality standards, and remember I just told you they're getting much, much tighter, then you have to come up with a plan. And that plan identifies how much pollutant the stream, the river can uh, accept and still meet water quality standards, including the state's anti-degradation policies, uh, as well as the anti-backsliding policies. But that's what the state then identifies based on what the river can handle. How do you distribute that out? Some goes to point sources like us, the wastewater treatment plants. Some goes to non point sources. Some goes to background, which is there naturally. And some goes to what the state may elect to preserve for future growth and development, or just because they want to make sure they stay above the water quality criteria. Uh, and that's a very complex exercise, uh, but since they had engineers design the program, they converted it into mass loads, which is just simply the amount of flow 
times the concentration that a discharger can release. Uh, and that's how you get mass out of it. So it becomes a total maximum daily load. Does that make sense? No? Yes. Okay, well, one of these days you can explain it all to me. But, uh, and that's why in some of the, I guess as offshoot of that, some of the flexibility we've created in our permit allows us to shift those loads between our various sources. So on some conditions, we want to shift some of the flow and the load down to Rock Creek from Forest Grove, we can do that. When we built a natural treatment system, we could shift some of it back up there and use that natural treatment system in order to achieve our permit compliance. Okay, giving us great flexibility, great opportunity, and giving Rick a few more years of life without having to figure out what he has to build at Rock Creek. Did I get that right, Rick? Yeah. And so, as I said, this permit, oops, this permit is transformative. It's going to carry us into our next permit, which we are targeting in about 2028. 2028, really, the thing we've got to do there is make sure we are ready, carrying us into the future, 30 to 40 years in the future. Uh, and there's going to be a lot that we have to do about it. You'll hear about PFOS uh, a little bit. Amanda will talk about our pretreatment program, which is going to raise in importance as we try to figure out how to handle some of these industrial pollutants. We'll be talking about reuse of the biosolids is going to grow in importance as we try to figure out what we do with all the solids that come out of our treatment plants. The solids we grow bacteria, bacteria help us remove the pollutants. We skim some of those off, dry them off, and they become a soil amendment, but there's a lot of concern about what's associated with that. How do we make sure that they're safe to put on the land? Um, we talked a little bit about wrestling with the dichotomy of aluminum and phosphorus. We'll hear about that from Julian just a, a little bit. But, but beyond just the water pollutant, we are also becoming much more aware that we've got to pay attention to the greenhouse gases associated with our collection system and our treatment and are starting to monitor for that. Uh, and all of this as a time we're starting to look at what is our relationship with us, our member cities, and how do we both or all group of us move forward in the future in a way that allows us to continue to be compliant with the permits, but allows the cities to have uh, more control over what they are doing for stormwater in the collection system or uh, the waste transport. So really a much more integrated approach not only with the permit, but our relationship with the cities. And that is what we expect in 2028. And really, it's got to provide us the technology and the regulatory path to carry us into a crystal ball for 30 to 40 years out. With that, come on. I touched on most of the drivers. Um, the only ones I'll touch on that I haven't is. We are also experiencing changes in rainfall patterns, how long our seasons last that we need to begin to adjust to, begin to predict. Uh, talk about the TMDL, we're trying to model what will happen to our water, water quality uh, in future years. Reuse is a big part of that as we've got a dependable water supply that we can provide very good clean water to the number of uses that we want to expand. So our approach is going to be much different than just what do we treat and at what level, but how do we continue to provide some environmental enhancement with the uh, opportunities that we do have? How do we make sure we are being responsive to not only climate change, but increasing water demand? We really do expect to see about the same amount of rainfall, mostly in the winter, but longer, hotter, drier summers that we will have to make it through. And how does our water fit into that? I think I touched on all of the uh, uh, others, the rest of them, but those are the key drivers. And then, since I think I'm running out of time, keep it the wrong one. We are also looking at the risk. When are some of these going, you know, risk in a number of ways. Not only is it going to happen, do we think it's going to happen? When do we think it's going to happen? 
I'll touch on the nitrates just as an example. Nitrates are a growing concern, environmental concern throughout the country. State of Oregon just uh, is going through the process of trying to hire somebody to study nitrates because of the impact of acidification, low dissolved oxygen, and eutrophication off the coast, off the Columbia River. We've seen that other places. That's going to end up influencing us in some way. We want to make sure that as that's going to influence us, we have gathered the information so that we can help DEQ make their decisions with good, solid information about what our relative contribution is and what happens uh, with our discharges, like cuts down biosolids, air toxics. Uh, you'll hear about PFOS in just a little bit, and I think that's just a harbinger of the kind of issues we're going to be facing with uh, more and more emerging pollutants. As we can measure things down into the nano and picograms, we're going to find more of it, and we're going to understand it better. We're going to have to think a little bit differently about how do we manage uh, wastewater, how do we manage industrial discharges so that we can meet our standards. Viruses got really interesting uh, with COVID. People started to think about viruses rather than just bacteria tracers of what may make humans sick. How that comes out of the wastewater treatment plants is going to be a big concern to EPA and others. Uh, we have a program where we're beginning to understand that now again, getting ahead of the game. Uh, and then it touched on the stormwater, stormwater standards. Stormwater is the one area that EPA says is still growing in pollutants, one sector. We expect there to be a lot of emphasis on stormwater. We think the approach we have to try to integrate stream restoration uh, with our stormwater program has lots of benefits. Now's the time to be able to demonstrate that so that we can get that incorporated into the regulation. And with that, Julia, it's yours. Hi there. Excuse me. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Bob. Um, my name is Julia Crown. I'm at Clean Water Services. I work for Bob in Regulatory Affairs. Um, and I thought I'd just introduce myself a little bit and give you a little background um, since I haven't uh, presented before this committee yet. Um, I used to work in a pretreatment program at another local municipality. And before that, I worked at DEQ, or State of Oregon Regulatory um, Agency, and I developed TMDLs, total maximum daily loads uh, that were just defined by Bob, um, doing surface water quality modeling, and also um, then analyzed data for the Pesticide Stewardship Partnerships um, program. And so my role here is to bridge um, that state regulatory world um, to and translate it through the permit um, into the permit implementation that we have here, um, our MPDS discharge permit. And so um, sort of day to day, I answer a lot of questions about the permit, um, do interpretation, um, answer questions or explain the requirements. Um, it is a very complex permit and so um, takes a, a team to, to um, work through it. Um, and then also, that's on the clean water services side, also go do that advocacy back to DEQ. So it's sort of, the, you know, that conduit through the permit of communication. Um, you know about clean water services. Um, I like to start with this slide to sort of ground into the um, Twalton Basin. Um, this is a very special basin. It's where I was born and raised and um, closely follows the um, boundaries of Washington County. Um, Clean Water Services holds the permit for the four wastewater treatment plants and the MS4 stormwater um, that all discharge to the one and only river in our county, the um, small but mighty Tualatin River. And so that river does a lot of work for us. Um, I don't, can I, could someone change the slide? I don't think, or do I have a way to control the slides? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so I thought I'd start with the permit renewal process because um, we're talking about going through a couple of permit renewal processes um, into the future. So this one, um, that we just passed. So I started at Clean Water Services three years ago during the pandemic um, in 2021. And um, 
regulatory affairs department had just submitted the application for the permit renewal at the end of 2020. And so the whole first year that I was um, uh, working remotely at home um, was preparing for those negotiations with DEQ. Um, I was mostly working on copper and aluminum data um, interpretation, analysis interpretation. And then that second year was when we really got into the permit negotiations um, with DEQ. There were a lot of meetings, a lot of spreadsheets, um, a lot of memos, and you know, it took a full year of, of working with them to get them. Um, they renewed the permit at the in December of 2022, and then we had less than a month to um, implement implement it. It was effective in January of last year, and so we've had one full year um, and almost a quarter of implementation of this new permit. And right after that permit was renewed, um, Bob and Rad made a list of the tasks that we need to do in during this permit cycle, the things that we need to do to um, meet compliance with our current our current permit, but also what things that we need to do to get ready um, for our next permit. We were already, you know, immediately thinking about um, a debriefing and thinking about what to do to prepare for the next permit cycle, which there are five year permit cycles, but um, you know, that date of when that permit application is due, it's June 3rd, 2027. And that's um, a deadline that's, you know, just, it's gonna come up really very quickly. Um, so this word cloud is um, words that Steve Choate put this together for us. It represents words from that list of tasks. And I mean, the first thing to notice is that there's a lot of words here. There's a lot of things that we need to do in the next, in that, you know, that four and a half year, now three and a half years before the permit renewal application is due. And also these terms, um, these tasks are, there's a variety, there's a wide variety of things that we need to do. And the permit impacts all the departments at clean water services and they're very like cascading impacts. Once you start pulling a thread, they're very interconnected. Once you start pulling a thread on one topic, you'll start to um, start touching other topics across the agency. So um, if we go to the next slide, please. We needed to start coming up with a strategy for this transition to the permit of the future so that we can control our, um, we wanting, we're wanting to control our destiny. And, um, oops, sorry about that. I'm trying to find you guys again. Okay, there we go. And get ahead of, uh, get ahead of the regulations and control our destiny. Um, so this, um, we need a strategy because we're working with very technical, highly technical, multi-layered, cross-departmental, <laughs> highly complex, um, you know, topics that are requiring multiple subject matter experts, expertise across um, departments. So one of the things that we're um, wanting to use this strategy for is a communication tool to help um, everyone in the agency know what they're working on, how that helps with permit compliance, um, but also the, you know, the purpose and the goal of their work and how that, you know, how their work fits in um, to permit compliance. And um, we are going to be using the roadmap uh, structure. Um, and we'll, uh, Laura will talk more about the roadmaps itself. Um, and one of the first things we did was define long-term, long-term regulatory compliance strategy. Um, we're working in five-year cycles, so it made sense for us to look at the current permit as a five-year, the next five years, then look at the next permit, which we're already preparing for, for the next five years, and then the next, next permit, you know, the permit that is beyond. So looking at 15 years um, and beyond. And I like to think of this, um, as well, you know, in 15 years, I'm, I'll still be working, um, hopefully still in this field. And so talking to my future self, you know, what are the things that my future self in 15 years would like to have started on now? Because it will take, 
you know, 15 years of implementation to get the, to the goals that we want to achieve um, and get these programs going. Um, I'm in Denver right now at the water reuse symposium, and there's people here who are talking about um, water reuse programs that took, you know, they've been working on them for 30 years and it took 30 years to get to where they are. And it's, it's, you know, massively impressive, but they um, are saying it's one step at a time, you know, and start and start now. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So I uh, will turn this over to Laura now. Laura, oh, there you are. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Laura is our expert in project management. There's a question. Yeah, if I could ask. Um, since you know Bob described like DEQ is stretched thin, relies heavily on us, and we're pretty much leading, you know, leading the charge on some things. But what types of negotiations? I'm curious. Do they press back? Like what? Like in general, you don't have to get into the meat of things, but what types of negotiations are there? Bob, you want to go ahead and? Yeah, I can take your shot at that. You know, do you want to come up to the camera? What's that? Uh, do I have to be on camera? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, from DQ's perspective, they focus on a couple of a uh, number of things. One of them is that they want us to be able to demonstrate that we do indeed meet the water quality standards with the discharges that we do have. Uh, and then they also want to make sure that they can understand what we are proposing to do. They can put that into our permit uh, so that they can understand it and that uh, they can regulate it as well. And that it is understandable enough that they don't get third party lawsuits that debate whether they are regulating us to ensure we meet those water quality criteria. One of the biggest advantages we do have is Julia's work with DQ. I used to write the permits and manage the permit program, so I have some empathy for DQ, but their pushback really is, can we demonstrate we are meeting the water quality criteria? And can we be clear enough about how we are doing that, that they can write a permit that can regulate us and prevent third party lawsuits debating whether they're doing so? Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. We can also give an example with the thermal program. There was recently an article on it that there's serious concerns by the environmental community about temperature trading and how examples across Oregon is not done in a way that the EQ would like. And what they said was clean water services is doing it in the way that it should be done. It was really a great um, kudos to the team here. And that really clean water services um, is doing it not only the way that it should be done, but it's the way it should be successful. And the problem is if others had done it first, this program would have not gotten off the ground with the EQ. So that's why um, for clean water services, it's really important that we can demonstrate how to do it, how to do it well so DEQ can regulate it. And um, we're not doing this because we like to be innovative. We're doing this to be protective of the ratepayers. Because if we don't do these things that are innovative, then Rick would be very happy. He would have to build all sorts of treatment technology that begins making essentially drinking water out of our wastewater. And that cost curve that we're on is astronomical if you don't control it. And, and and it doesn't create the environmental benefits that we can create within the watershed. So I do want to give Bob and, and the team incredible kudos. And, and that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. And just to follow up on what Diane said, Dave, it was both Oregon's DEQ and uh, the most litigious of the environmental groups who cited us as having this type of program, which gets to your question about where, where does the negotiation happen? Yeah. And they successfully sued us in the past. Yes, they have. That's <laughs> yeah. something we don't necessarily need to brag about, but yes. Yes. <laughs> and we don't want to be there again. Yeah. So my name is Laura Porter. I've been in the industry for about 25 years. And when I was in grad school, they kept referring to clean water services as the example of what to do. So of course. I graduated, tried to get a job at Clean Water Services, didn't. Um, so I worked in consulting for nine years, and now I've been at Clean Water Services for 14 years. And 
I get to work with people like Bob, who you guys remember encyclopedias. He's our walking talking encyclopedia. I'd say Wikipedia, but it would be it would need to be a journal of cited articles, the knowledge that Bob brings to us. And then Julia, she's actually the project manager of this overall project and getting to support her. her I don't know if you guys have seen the permit. It's 150 pages. The fact sheet, which is supposed to help explain the permit so you don't have to read all 150 pages, I believe it's 200 pages. So Julia and Bob know that permit forwards and backwards. And I mean, if you open to any page, there's so much technical jargon in there. It's like, what do you do with this? So it's been really fun to work on this project with Julia, Bob, and Rick as well. And then Steve Choke and I have been supporting Julia. We're both on the strategy team and we get put on projects as needed to support those teams. And I have a bunch of project management experience. My work now is what are we doing to deliver on strategy? So our executive team has put together the spring strategy for clean water services and what this strategic roadmap is doing is structuring all the work that we're already doing in a way to prepare for that next permit. So we're proactively getting ready so that we aren't ending up spending money on things that we don't need to, that we've got all the data and information in place so that they can do that negotiation. Because these permits are complicated and there's a lot of jargon in there. So the strategic roadmaps are all about and this one in particular, enhancing collaboration across the district, we exist, clean water services exist because of this permit. And so we're working across departments. It's not just in regulatory affairs, but regulatory affairs is our interface with DEQ and they are also our experts on the permit. We're ensuring alignment with our strategic approach, proactively identifying and mitigating risks. We're starting to lay out all of our actions and how does it help us address a risk for this permit, the next permit, the one after that. And we're really continuing to think about how do we maximize benefits to the watershed? Because if we take care of the watershed, then it'll be easier for us to meet our permit. Building partnerships internally and externally, and then addressing all of Clean Water Service's key strategic outcomes. So this is our we have a specific name for it. Let me see if I can find it. This is our leadership system. Thank you. It's in um, our performance excellence light application. You guys might have heard about before. And so we're using this process and applying it to the strategic roadmap. There's a way to do this. Okay. So what have we done so far with developing the strategic roadmap? Uh, we developed, you've seen the roadmaps before. We've developed the preamble of why are we doing it? So the purpose, so that as all of these people across Clean Water Services look at it, they understand that we're doing this so that we can work together to meet our regulatory requirements. We've defined our goals and our strategies, and I'll hand it over to Julia in a little bit to talk about those specific strategies. And we've also set it into phases. So our department and program roadmaps are more what is going on for the next few years. The strategic roadmaps are looking long term. This permit, the next permit, after the next permit. We're starting work on putting, we're already managing our permit from a risk perspective, but it may not be in that language. So we're starting to reorganize how we do stuff. So that's like, what is our risk? Our risk is meeting our permit limits. We have to do that. Well, what are the things underneath our permit limits that we need to be doing to make sure that we continue to meet new permit, new permit requirements or um, new, um, new limits for constituents that we haven't ever had a requirement for? And in that process, we'll be doing a gap analysis. And then we're also integrating with all of the other roadmaps. I'm sure you guys have been in introduced to the roadmaps. We our core team has actually read all the roadmaps to make sure that we're all pulling it into this. And then also eventually we will um, be able to use this for long term financial planning as well. So this strategic roadmap and so um, last time I saw you guys, I was actually Jamie Waltz was talking about the climate action roadmap. 
And one of the questions that came up when we were talking about the climate action roadmap is, if we're already doing this work, then why do we need a strategic roadmap? And it's really this communication between the different roadmaps so that we can, we can look big picture, see what's going on, talk with our departments. If they're not working on it already, ask them to start working on it. And then when our departments are out in the field and they discover something, they can report back to the strategic roadmap. So for example, it, for, um, it makes it possible to have really good vertical and horizontal communication throughout the district. And then the program roadmaps can get pulled in as well. And this is my favorite slide. I referred to this when we were talking about the climate action roadmap. So this is from performance excellence. So every single one of these arrows is important. It's all of this is good work. But early in the process, it's uh, when we're hit with a new issue and we're trying to react to it and figure it out, we may not be aligned. So maybe this is where we were 20 years ago. Clean Water Services is actually really recognized for being proactive, for being on top of this. The, the Baldridge Review Board, when they came out and looked at what Clean Water Services was doing, this is one of the areas where we got really high marks was in regulatory compliance. So as you move through the cycle, it starts to come together and eventually you're aligned. So that would be like the department roadmaps. But then as you integrate all the department roadmaps, we become integrated. And then that way we're catching projects that maybe we're working on the same thing, but slightly different perspectives. How do we bring those resources together to get the most recent return on investment? And then also capturing any gaps that we might have not recognized. Otherwise, so with this, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Julia. Great. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it. Um, so, as Laura said, we, um, the, the program and department roadmaps need to roll up to the strategic road roadmaps and there needs to be interplay between those roadmaps. Um, so uh, those different levels of roadmaps. So um, we um, modeled our this regulatory compliance roadmap after the climate action roadmap, used that heavily as a model. Um, and there's, I think, you know, many ways to come up with a strategy and organize and come up with a framework and structure. Um, what we landed on was um, what I like to call the October sprint last fall after the fall conference season um, when schedules opened up a little more. Um, we had like this series of intensive meetings where, um, like Laura said, we read all of the department roadmaps and the one of the program roadmaps and we identify the objectives and initiatives within those roadmaps um, that were related to compliance services. And then we, you know, lifted those out of the roadmaps and put them onto um, a Miro board. It's a, a virtual whiteboard onto the sticky notes. And Steve had the, um, we're very grateful to Steve for taking on that task of doing that work. And um, then we took those sort of virtual sticky notes from the different department roadmaps and then regroup them in ways that made sense um, into different strategies, into new strategies. Um, what that did immediately was decouple the objective initiative from a department and pulled it out of the, away from the department and into um, these new groupings of strategies. And so automatically these strategies are going to require um, cross departmental teams. They're going to require people from all of these teams to work together to um, implement the strategy. Um, and I think, yeah, could we go to the next slide? So this is what we started with, with a list of tasks that we need to get done by June 3rd, 2027. And then next slide. After that October sprint, we came up with um, this framework and the structure around um, how we're going to um, implement all of these um, tasks. So this is the this is the framework and the structure that we have right now. Um, and I just wanted to show this. It's we have three um, we have a three pronged approach. There's three equal goals. The first one is. Um, 
responsibility to our permits, to our discharge permits. Um, we have regulatory responsibilities and staying in compliance with our discharge permits. And then those um, teal colored boxes are the strategies that we're going to implement to meet that goal. There's an equally weighted goal of watershed resiliency um, for clean water services. And um, we have to have a river to discharge to, and the healthier our watershed is, the healthier our river is, um, the better it is for our basin. Um, and then we recognized as our third goal that um, we can't do this alone. We are in community, and so we have a strategy. We have strategies around the goal of building partnerships. Um, let's see. And then um, I guess next slide. Um, so I, are we okay on time to give the next example? Um, I thought it'd be helpful to have an example around this. Yeah, we have time, Julia. Okay, thanks. Um, so we have, a, I mean, Clean Water Services has multiple, multi, multidisciplinary teams, cross departmental teams. Um, so we and so I wanted to give an example of how these work. Um, the idea is that as we build these cross departmental teams, um, we'll create you bring these subject matters experts together um, into these groups and create these synergies that will have products that are uh, more, you know, we can produce something more than what we could do individually or in, with individual departments. Um, and I wanted to give an example of this, a collaboration from a group that just um, concluded a major phase of work. Um, and it's just really um, been a, a pro project that's been near and dear to my heart. Um, so, and it, we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. This will be um, just give a flavor. And I think this is a model of how these could work. And my, you know, my hope is that everyone um, that as we deform, as we form these teams, um, everyone at clean water services will get to work on 1 of these teams and work on projects that are, um, you know, complex, um, interesting and fun. Um, so for this, for this example, um, this is. We're working on a phosphorus TMDL update. Um, we have the distinction of having the first watershed based um, TMDL in the United States. It was established in 1988 and it's been updated twice since then. Um, that TMDL was written by uh, State of Oregon, DEQ, um, and by one of our friends here in the room. Um, to address the frequent algae blooms and pH exceedances that occurred in the lower part of the river. Um, the lower part of our river being that slow moving lake like um, tranquil part of our river. Um, and that TMDL recognized that um, phosphorus um, inputs to the river from non point sources and from point sources was contributing to those algae blooms. Um, during the summer. And so, um, as Bob explained, DEQ allocated um, a phosphorus load to the non point sources and also um, gave a load allocation, a waste load allocation to the point sources, of which we are the point sources, the treatment plants that we have at Rock Creek and Durham um, got these phosphorus limits that were then implemented into a, um, our permit. Um, next slide, please. In the 35 years since that TMDL was first published, um, there have been many improvements in the basin. Um, and I've, there's two highlighted here that really um, made a very big difference in um, the phosphorus and the algae bloom um, water quality in the Tualatin River. Um, one is up in the upper watershed. We have our Hag Lake and Barney Reservoir stored water rights. Um, in the summer, we augment flow by releasing cold water from those reservoirs and maintain a minimum summer flow of 160 to 180 CFS in the river. Um, the 7Q10 used to be 33 CFS. So having that water in the river helps move the river and move that water along and um, decreases the algae blooms in the lower river. In the lower end of the river, also helping um, out with this water quality situation, um, there's a 
a dam that Lake Oswego Corps has at the bottom of the river that um, holds water as it, um, as expected and pushes water back to their canal so that they can access water and, and draw water from the Tualatin River to their um, lake. That dam used to push water all the way back to Durham facility and then all the way back to Rock Creek, um, really making that lake very, very slow moving, very much um, like the river more like a lake in that lower area. They lowered the, um, they took off some of the flashboards off the top of the dam and lowered the level of the dam so that water can now from the Tualatin River spill over, move out of the basin, spill over the dam and, and move down to the to Willamette. Um, and again, that decreased residence time so that algae doesn't have time in the summer to um, grow and stagnate and grow. So um, if you go to the next slide, those were great improvements um, to water quality to the point where the model, um, our, our models and our data agree um, that phosphorus inputs are no longer the controlling or limiting factor for algae blooms in the lower river. Um, they do not occur with the same frequency that they did 35 years ago. Um, for our treatment plants, we uh, controlled um, phosphorus from our treatment plants. They lowered the levels of phosphorus um, using just a variety of methods, but one of them was using um, alum in the tertiary stage, which is aluminum sulfate. And some of that aluminum that we add to control phosphorus would make it into um, the discharge and then discharged into the river. A couple of years ago, EPA, I mean, very recently, EPA promulgated to Oregon a new aluminum water quality standard. So that really put us in um, a conflict. We have two competing regulations that we need to meet at the same time um, at two of our large treatment plants. And so this, um, you know, we're really trying to navigate between two competing and conflicting regulations um, that are only becoming more and more stringent. Um, so this struggle is what we, you know, got this group of people together um, to work through, to talk this issue through, to come up with um, solutions. And the first part of that is understanding the regulatory landscape and being able to communicate that and then work through um, some problem solving and brainstorming with the group that um, will then have to um, try to figure out the technology to um, address um, these competing limitations. So um, I wanted to, next slide, I wanted to turn this over to Rick, who's on our team, to talk about the technology. Um, to, after we've talked about the regulatory landscape, we hand that over to, to research innovation to figure out what the technology will be. And then, um, and then, as Laura said, you know, sort of the third phase is then, you know, how do we finance that? Well, thanks, Julia. Well, yep. We're working with strategists, so they were strategic enough to give me one slide. So I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> so I'm not going to go too into the weeds. So um, we mentioned tertiary treatment. Diane mentioned we're getting close to water quality. So this is the last step and basically before disinfection when we are going through the treatment plants um, for meeting our limits. And it's very critical for meeting phosphorus and the whole aluminum thing comes into play. So. Uh, this example talks about the different things we're thinking of um, as we're looking at our planning work. So we've been here a few times. I've been here a few times talking about West Face and Master Plan, and there's lots of stuff going on, and these pieces work together. So this is really a great example of another effort that's going on outside the plan, but really informs the work that we're doing. The top row talks about some technology. So I'll get, I will give you a little brief overview. So these filters, when we say granular filters, just think sand, basically, 10 by 10, you know, sandbox. There's different types of media. There's other than that, but in simple terms, that's more or less what we're doing. It's what we have today, and it works really great, and it's proven, and we've had great success um, meeting our permit and doing better than our permit with that system. We are always looking at options, potential ways to save money and, and meet our limits while still protecting water quality. So one of the systems out there is called disk filters. So I don't know if anybody else had a rake to, to rake shag carpet um, like I did in my house back in the 70s. But it's just filters <laughs> are basically like 10 foot diameter discs. You know, maybe this why they have this carpeting type material on each side. The water goes through that, comes in the middle, it's cleaned out. 
They are very cost effective. As you can see of, of the 3 options, they're definitely the lowest um, on the cost scale and they have a very uh, effectiveness from a total cost standpoint, but I'll get into some of the other factors that, you know, that we have to consider when we're looking at things. Cost isn't, isn't the whole recipe that we have to to uh, work with. And then the final one is membrane. So if anybody has, you know, a little membrane system in your house to treat your water, it's very similar to that. Your, your very, very fine membranes, um, it's the next level. You're going to find that commonly in water treatment plants um, as a technology there. So it's a very high cost. It has a lot of low-end end costs, um, but why would we want to consider that? Well, it's this road mapping. We, we see at some point in time, because of the change in regulatory landscape, we're probably going to need to do something beyond the system we have today. So the first trail of anticipated performance is sort of, if we were to continue on the path we're on, what we do today works great. Disc filters, they work okay. They, they'll meet that limit. But as we get into future performance issues and regulatory issues with constituents of emerging concern, I'll say PFAS again, we should all have to do something every time we hear PFAS tonight. But that's a big thing that's on our mind, along with other things. They don't really work so great for that. And they also take up a lot of space. So when we're doing our planning work, we have to think about all these scenarios and the footprint that within the treatment plant, not only for this tertiary, but what about biosolids? What if we have to treat for PFAS? So we have to plan our siting to make sure that all those things fit. Hey, membranes, of course, the most expensive. It's great for performance. It's great for the future regulatory scenarios, and it's a small footprint, um, but it's that cost thing. So we really need to try to use our, our best um, methods, and, and, and Bob and the team in RAB does their best to try to crystal ball what the future brings, and we, we want to position ourselves no matter what to be able to meet those limits, but we may not spend that money today. We may figure out how to adapt to a different technology in the future. So it is a very integrated process. Um, it's the entire team. The last piece integration with plant is more, we do like to factor in how does operations and maintenance feel about these systems. So, you know, the less complex, the better, if we can stick with what they have for a long period of time, that puts us in a great position. From their perspective, but does it get us to where we need to be in the future? So I'll close by saying this, this look about where do we need to be and Bob saying, well, I've given you three years. He, he gives me enough time by design that we can do planning, design, construction. They are thinking ahead far enough that this team deal can go one way or the other. And we've baked into our schedule. We have roadmaps to go this direction or that direction. And so that's where it's really important. Uh, having this long-term compliance strategy, uh, thinking it far enough in the future so we can be adaptable and be prepared for it. This is so important for the ratepayers' pocketbook. The moment we have to trigger membranes, if we have not planned financially, then you're spiking the rates, right, to the rate base. So that's why seeing when this potential could happen, we make sure working with Kathy and with Jack and the team, we can build the rate structure so it's not spiking things. And um, that's really an important component to clean water services plan so that we can do this long range planning and not be caught short. Because if you don't, a court could tell you what to do. And the court time frame is very short, <laughs> and um, we want to be able to to get the financial capacity we need to do this. So we know it's coming. Yep. It's just a matter of when, and have we built the financial resilience to really manage this? And that's why being on the budget committee is going to be really fun. <laughs> that's part of the the budget the 101 that we're going to be doing. But um, I think it's it's critical. As to the why. I'm sorry, Diane, did you say that the membranes are coming? We just don't know when yet. We're trying to trigger it out into the future. So if it's not membrane, we call Dr. Williamson, if you remember, he would call it the slow march to reverse osmosis. Because okay. the technology beyond membrane is even more costly. So, but I, my Ouija board says membranes are coming. It's just when, and we're trying to trigger it when we actually need it. I think Bob sees the same. You know, absolutely. Same. How do you plan so you're not abandoning any technology invested in along the way, not wasting anything? 
Okay. And we see this because it's not just aluminum, it's copper. It, there's a whole long list of, um, they call it contaminants of emerging concern. So the question is, when do we pull that trigger? And Rick, I know when his team gets it, they'll have a project that's well planned, well thought out, and Kathy and Jack will make sure we have the money um, so that we can uh, we can do this. Yeah. In a way that doesn't have any impact on it. That doesn't spike it. Yeah. So it's predictable. The rates are predictable. Yeah. Um, I didn't see this one. So next steps are fairly straightforward. So I think people not with any clean water services and external partners. I think we're we're underway with that and um, really happy with the progress that we're making. And it is it is uh, Julia said, oh but everyone gets an opportunity to work with something. It's, it's really fun stuff for us within the district to share our knowledge and passion across the different departments. And then future presentations, um, board learnings. We've had one board learning on this. Um, we're going to have an update later. I think it's Shannon Bosch or Diane, roughly that. September. Yeah. And of course, we'll be back to see what it's like. Can we sit yeah. in on the board learnings? That'd be okay. Yeah, the public can come. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we can share when when they are. Yeah. Yep. They're during the day, just as that one's out. I'm retired. So I, uh, I don't know if it's uh, directed to Rick, but um, I saw vodka's two parts. First one is more like a introspection. What I heard several times during the presentation from both Bob and uh, okay. Laura, permit is complex, the permit is complex, permit is complex, 150 pages, 200 pages. Plus. And it's telling me that the more complex it gets, it follows that it's going to be harder to comply. I'm sure there's going to be more exceptions and excursions. So is there any thought or strategy to say, can there be a simpler approach? Can there be a simplification approach? Um, from my own experience, as a, I used to work in the chip design industry. Uh, the more complex the part got, the harder it was to validate, the harder it was to get it to market. So. We used to work extensively on how can we simplify that, or how can we at least get a simplified look and approach to that. What are we doing about? I know the Clean Water Act is common. We don't have any control over that, but I'm assuming that the permit we get is something that's customized and specific to our. There's some thought that can go into. I think you guys know where I'm going with this, but. Bob and I, we can talk about plan Z. So <laughs> Z, when all else fails and you can't discharge to the Tualatin River anymore, because really what we're managing is what we need for the Tualatin River for this region to continue to return its water to the Tualatin River. Plan Z we think about, which is you actually need to get a new discharge on the Columbia River. But that's that's really way out, way out into the future. We do believe with technology we can manage and continue to return water because the water comes from the Dwalin River Basin. You're returning the water back. But I'm hoping, I think I will be retired. <laughs> and see when we have to truly think about plant, and that's expensive. You know, it's getting a pipeline with a huge pump station, routing it up and over the hill and, and into the Columbia, but the Columbia has issues too that are emerging. Right? Exactly. Yeah, it's so it is not as large as Columbia. Correct. Not even as large as the Willamette. So isn't there an easier way to comprehend and capture that so that it's easy for us to apply to that program? I wish, but no, it get the complex. So huh. the reason why we're doing this at Clean Water Services is because we see the complexity getting even, even greater. And um, it's at a certain point, our water will literally become drinking water because of the technology that is gonna have to go on to the end of the treatment plan. I think it's beyond this next 
25 year window, but that's where the, it's going. And then at that question, it opens up a whole new resource, doesn't it? So that's why we're talking about water reuse. In the yeah, my, my recommendation is, uh, as you go through your strategy plan, your discussion with partners and everything, I think an approach with this back of your mind might help get you to a better, easier, whatever adjective you want to put behind that solution, rather than just follow the herd saying, yes, it's getting complex, so let's make our appliance more complex. Let's make a solution even more complex and make it interesting. That's my rhetoric, by the way. Actually, I'd, I'd like to touch on that. And at the risk of saying anything that may sound inconsistent with what my boss said, uh, Give me a chance to defy them. Go yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think we'll get to the point where we don't have a complex permit and our regulations aren't complex. But one of the uh, huge advantages I've seen of the work that you've just heard about from Julia and, and others, uh, Laura, is the close integration of not only where we see the criteria and our limits going, but what the plants are going to be designed for. And what I think is, if we can continue on that path, we will be able to at least simplify some of the complexity of our permit to make sure that we can still comply with what kind of plant that we have developed. An example of that uh, may be the ammonia limits, where we have a whole series of stacked flows, and then if then, statements. If it's this flow, this is the ammonia. If this flow, this is the ammonia. The new design is we better understand how we bring ourselves into the nitrification mode in the summer uh, and go out in the fall. We may be able to simplify that so it's a much less of a series of it than statements, but it'll probably still be flow related so that we can operate differently to maximize winter treatment uh, than we do in the summer to maximize summer treatment. Do you think I missed that? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. While I have Baldwin's attention, that's the second part to something else I observed. Uh, both of you talked about risks, risk analysis, and so on. So uh, help me understand if your risk analysis includes what we call as a mitigation plan for risks that you know to somehow avoid them, some kind of a contingency plan if it happened, if something hit the fan. You guys go through the detail. So I'll touch on that real briefly. So we are already managing our permit from a risk perspective because we already know what's in this permit. We're already seeing what's coming down the pike and what we expect to see in future permits. What we're doing now is we're capturing that work and putting it into a risk management structure. So it does say, here's a potential risk. Here are the things we're doing and the mitigation actions to meet that potential risk. And then eventually what we'll also get to, and we're doing, I'm sure we're already doing some of it already, is if that mitigation action doesn't work, then what's plan B? And then also once we have it in that structure, we can go and talk to the teams okay. and have risk managers and so yeah, the process track journey. the projects. But the concern I had at the table that Bob showed, I think it was slide number eight according to my comment. There was unknown and uh, those words are scary. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, what are we doing about it? Yeah. Either it's it's uh, unknown or uh, it then take it out of the shape, right? There is unknown, there is uncertain. Those are things you don't talk about in a risk analysis. If that's the case, then you leave it out or you go make sure it turns into known and. Well, and I think one example, though, is I don't know how many risk managers across the United States was ready for COVID. So we will do our best to predict what's coming, but there, unfortunately, there could be something. I mean, my kids the other night were talking about microplastics, right? So there's these emerging contaminants of concern that hopefully we'll have a heads up. Hopefully we can be proactive. And I would expect that the majority of the time we will be. It gets on our risk assessment when we start hearing the chatter from EPA. 
So, and they're starting to talk about viral, viral disinfection. So mm -hmm. we follow it really closely. And so that's why it's on that list. We're not sure what the time frame is yet. But I think your point of having contingency plans, we are developing contingency plans. We have done that. Uh, our lab, which is a great lab, has figured out how to do the analysis for the viruses that uh, using the methods EPA has proposed to recommend. Our research group is going beyond that, trying to develop more effective and efficient ways to measure the virus. We've started looking at what that may mean uh, for our effluent quality so that as Rick gets into the design, he will know what he has to design that could achieve either of those criteria. And then we can make those contingency plans about what makes sense at that time uh, for the disinfectant. Yeah. yeah, virus is a good example. So we're looking at different options. One's an alternative chemical that wouldn't work well for virus. It'd be great, it'd, it'd be really nice today, but it won't work well for virus. And so unless it's very compelling, it's not something we want to put in place. Yeah, see, that way you can also put butterfly protective explains in this list, right? But the thing is, there needs to be a threshold where your reportedly focus goes. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think it gives me the feeling that you know, but can't turn your priorities or well, and this is an early example. We're still okay. working through that process right now. So eventually we will do we will do probability, what would the impact or the consequence be? And then we can mul multiply those numbers together and start to prioritize. But right now we're identifying those risks. And um Bob is our he's he's the one who has the best ear on the ground of what are our highest priority things that we need to be working on. And so now we're starting to put that into a framework. So this is just yeah, a, three years to do that. Um, well, hopefully we have it done before <laughs> then. But I guess the next, by the next meeting, we will have. Yeah. I will say it's interesting to me that you talked about the complexity. Yeah. How complex do we make the risk analysis? You can make risk analysis. We could spend a year trying to develop a, a defensible probabilities, or Bob can tell me. Yeah, that's probably good. It, so there's this whole, but that's what we're kind of in the middle of right now is trying to make this as meaningful as can be, as defensible as can be, but but not make it so complicated that uh, it's it's it, it, you, you can get 90% right with without all of the complexity to some level. There is a lot to uh, the risk analysis piece that we're sorting through to try to come up with the best way to. Oh, yeah, that's the right strategy, but it should be actionable. Oh, yeah. Agreed. It should be actionable. Otherwise, whatever it can now say, whatever mitigation contingency plans it come to is so what? I'll pray to God. No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With each of these risks, there are there are actions to be yeah. timing. Yeah. Yeah. I think I like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, I think that wraps up my question. Actually, I have a couple of questions, um, but the first one, um, I, when I retired, I retired out of Metro and I'm going to use a little example there to couch my question. Um, Metro manages the garbage for the region and Metro is, I suppose you would call a responsible party for lack of a more accurate term, but, um, Metro is has been tasked with achieving a certain recycling rate for the citizens of the region, the three county area. And so in order to try to tackle that, um, Metro doesn't like set any of the rates of garbage haulers or anything like that, but they try to do like massive education campaigns around source reduction. Now I'm not proposing any kind of big education campaign for clean water services, but I'm just wondering, um, it seems like there's an enormous burden of trying to anticipate what's coming in to the facilities and how to deal with it. Where is the policy end on source reduction? Is Clean water services involved in that, or is that more a DEQ EPA level, or is is that something that with some of these emerging contaminants, is that 
a feasible thing to try to just keep as much of it from coming in. Tells me we should do uh, environmental services, um, source control, um, bring that topic to, um, to CWAC because that's where we help manage and educate um, people as well as integrating with our community education program. So I think, uh, I think that's a great new topic for CWAC. It's a great question. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, the other question, or maybe more of a comment, on the um, graphic for organizing the roadmap where it's the responsibility to the permit, the watershed resiliency, and the partnerships, one thing that I would be really interested to see as that um, moves forward is how that can be viewed through an equity lens because um, it keeps coming to mind whether we're talking about availability and affordability of water in the summer, you know, for entire communities throughout the service district, um, but also where, where are equity considerations in this process? That's all I had. Thank you. That's great input. And I think I'm lost a little bit complex on its own, but to sort all of that out. But I think absolutely stormwater, I think, is a great example of uh, where we need to give that uh, some more thought. Make sure there's no questions from our online leadership. I don't see any hands turn here. Okay. Uh, well, moving on for our next agenda item, let's uh, talk about PFAS efforts. Okay. Right, I'm going to kick this one off as well. As the team is leaving, I will only note that uh, they've done a great job, and it has been one of the most rewarding exercises I've had uh, in my career. It's working with the team that really pulled much of this together. We've got a lot of work left to do, but uh, I think it was just emblematic of the kind of work that we need to do to move into the future. I'm just really proud of the efforts that they made. Another great team is the uh, team working on PFOS. Uh, with me is Amanda, I'm still talking a little bit. Uh, remotely is Scott and Summer, who will also be part of this presentation. And what I don't remember is I know we had talked to, uh, earlier when we first kicked off some of this PFOS work, uh, CWAC and others, but it's been quite a while since we have talked uh, about PFOS. Uh, we did go out and talk with uh, the river keepers, so I don't know if he's still on, but uh, even since then, we've gotten some new information, uh, so know some of this will be even new over the, the last couple of, uh, couple of weeks or months. The uh, in this presentation, but before I get started, I just wanted to see has everybody heard about PFOS, have some idea of the nature of the discussion. How many of you have seen Dark Waters? Yeah, great movie, wasn't it? Yeah, not really all that uh, warm and fuzzy, but a very good movie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what PFOSs are, why we're concerned about them, what it may mean for us. Uh, Scott? And uh, we'll talk about the uh, monitoring of research, what we've learned. Amanda will talk about source control. And part of Amanda will touch on pretreatment as well as what we can do to try to keep PFOS out of our system. Uh, pollution prevention, which we just heard about. Uh, we are doing a lot of work on preparing ourselves and our laboratory and research group for uh, BFOS into the future. Summer will talk about that and then we'll wrap up. So, real quickly, the term polyfluorinated kills some substances. That's what PFOS is long chain of carbon with fluoride after them, and then they got this head on. Uh, that head part is uh, hydrophilic likes water. The chain, the long chain tail there. It's hydrophobic. It doesn't like water, doesn't like grease. 
And so you end up with something that has this long tail that keeps the water and shifts it and moves it away. And that's something that holds on to it. So if you think about things that will beat up water, push it away, push grease away, that's what PFOS is. I don't know how many of you have raincoats, but they talk about that breathe. Don't get all sweaty in them. Better living through chemistry. Uh, and that's what it was developed for. Uh, same thing with works the same way. That's why it's in so much of our cooking equipment. Don't need the grease that keeps things separate. Uh, and it's used in a variety of products. It's pretty. Jody's laughing at me now. Oh, laughing at Joe's laughing at me. Used in a variety of products. Uh, and it has been since uh, really World War II. And when we do talk about better living through chemistry, it really was the PFOS. And there's thousands of them, different sizes, different formulations. They have some very similar uh, attributes and some attributes that are not so similar between them. Makes it really hard to understand and regulate them. The two that are most interest are the PFOS and the PFOA, uh, only because they're the ones that have originally received quite a bit of uh, research on their toxicity. And there's growing evidence of the toxicity, either in vitro and wound, uh, potentially uh, carcinogistic, uh, and other uh, health effects. A lot of the focus has been on uh, human health and drinking water, but we're starting to see some more uh, indications of the toxicity of wildlife, uh, fish uh, in the environment. Uh, one of the interesting things about the PFOS is they are not really well removed by our wastewater treat or water resource recovery facilities. They are shifted around. It comes in, some of it gets shifted into the biosolids, the longer chains, the ones that are usually more toxic and do build up in fish tissue often go into the biosolids. And then from the biosolids, they can be distributed on land. So there's a concern about what happens, what are the risks associated with the biosolids. Other interesting thing is, though really we don't break it down, there are some precursors where we'll snip off some of those chains uh, of uh, some of the thousands of similar compounds. So sometimes we see more of the PFOS uh, going through and coming out of our wastewater treatment, uh, coming out that actually went in. Uh, so it's very difficult then to track it down or provide treatment. Now, some treatment technologies are emerging, uh, and you'll hear about that. Scott will touch on that, as well as Amanda. Uh, they tend to work well with very, very clean water, or in some cases, uh, with water that happens to be very rich. But at the wastewater treatment kind of level, where we have some relatively low levels, there's not really an emerging technology that works at scale. Hopefully, in time, there will. Well, and they're found everywhere. Dust, serum, we've all got it in our blood uh, at various levels, hopefully. And what has been shown is it's reducing over time, which is good, uh, but we still have a lot of work to do. And so, what I wanted to show with this slide is they call it a forever chemical because it doesn't break down, it doesn't break down in the environment very much. Uh, and it is mobile. It tends to move around, uh, move around with water. Remember, so it has a water loving head on it, which the way it goes. Uh, and much of that ends up like so much what humans do uh, at our wastewater treatment plants so where we have to deal with it. Uh, some of it uh, then moves out from the biosolids and go to agricultural land. If you've been paying attention to uh, the PFOS stories, you will have heard of any number of nightmare events where the biosolids have been placed on land, farmers' cows picked up in the milk, they had to get rid of all the cows, or the cows died. Just that a real recent one occurred in Texas. Um, as Scott will talk about, there is a distribution. We're nowhere near those very high levels that people have seen and get excited about. And there's much less understanding what happens at the levels that uh, we have in our effluent and that we are discharging and hopefully we move it for. So there have been some dramatic issues, um, not at the levels that we are seeing, fortunately, uh, and we are still working to better understand where it's coming from, what we can do about it. 
if you follow all those arrows, it gets everywhere. But we are also learning more about how much is coming from mayor deposition. Uh, as it gets kicked up into the air, it's distributed, then comes down and spreads out. So there are a number of regulations that are coming up. We want to talk a year or so ago, perhaps two years ago, there's a lot of concern that the Environmental Protection Agency wasn't moving fast enough. And many states were moving on their own limits, trading limits, either for drinking water criteria or for aquatic life, fish and aquatic life. Um, and that was just a reflection of society's concern and the perception that EPA wasn't leading fast enough. Since then, EPA has developed, but on the federal level, is a very ambitious and a very quick, uh, fast process for developing new guidance, new criteria related to PFOS. They have published what they believe will be the drinking water criteria. Uh, and they've also published what they believe will be the uh, aquatic life uh, limits for PFOA and PFOS, the two that were the most of interest. Those are for protecting uh, aquatic life from toxicity. It's both a water quality criteria and a fish tissue criteria, which is somewhat unique. Uh, EPA is also working on uh, human health criteria related to what happens if people eat the fish in the river. Those are going to be orders of magnitude lower, and those are going to be the ones that we really need to pay attention to uh, when we start thinking about what our water resource recovery facilities can ultimately achieve. Uh, there will be limits as EPA is working on technology-based limits for a number of the industries uh, that discharge are known to produce uh, PFOS. Most of that effort has been based on the type of industries that actually create them rather than the receiving industry. So it may not influence us all that much. Uh, there might be some limits based on, on uh, the high tech industry for that. There's been a big debate about what we call the hazardous waste, how that defined. It's a hazardous waste. Uh, you're responsible for it from cradle to grave, as they say. And so if we create a problem or associated with the problem, we can be responsible for doing some of that cleanup. Because of that, our industry, uh, people who own, operate, and run public loan treatment works are really worried about how that's going to play out, uh, looking for an exemption from that. Whether that occurs or not, I don't know. These really exciting events like happened down in Texas don't make it any easier. But in any event, we fully expect there to be some focus on what happens with biosolids, what are the appropriate concentrations or application rates for the biosolids. Uh, drinking water, I said, those are uh, in process. Uh, EPA is looking at restrictions for what can or cannot be imported. The state of Oregon, uh, starting in 2025, will be limiting the amount of PFOS in food containers, uh, as many states have done. So. We start seeing some of that uh, source control beyond uh, the normal type of control to get at where PFOS is excess and not really needed uh, or providing a large societal benefit. And with that, Scott, I'm turning it over to you for the roadmap. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Internet's been kind of lousy here, so I um, just wanna make sure everything's all good. Uh, thanks, Bob. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work we're doing here at Clean Water Services to address PFAS. And I'm really proud of the work that our group has done. We are light years ahead of any other utility in the Pacific Northwest, for sure. Um, we've definitely established ourselves as a leader. Uh, and we really, the, the goal for us is to get ahead of the regulations and make sure that when they come to us, we're prepared for um, what they are so that we can address them in a way that is the most effective and you know protective of human health and the environment um, and making sure to the extent we can to help influence those regulations to make sure they're data driven. Um, Oregon is a little further behind than some of the other states where like back east where there's a lot more PFAS. And so we haven't had to deal with it as much. And so we kind of are lagging as far as data is concerned. And so part of the effort is to really learn some of these things. Uh, in our research and our data collection. So our roadmap for PFAS kind of has these five objectives. So the first is to kind of 
put it what's coming to us in context. So if we look at our treatment plants, you know, what is in our influent, our effluent, our biosolids, um, look at what our treatment options are, kind of understand what is our risk so we can see where we fit in the scheme of things. The second objective is looking upstream of the treatment plant. So that's looking at um, up in the collection system, looking at industries, uh, commercial facilities, domestic facilities, um, even looking upstream of the watershed in our urban creeks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Trying to understand, all right, so what are the sources that are coming to us? Um, really kind of characterize those, find out which ones matter the most so we can kind of tailor our pretreatment efforts that Amanda will talk about so that we can help address those at the source. Um, and the third is looking downstream of the treatment plant. So this is, all right, so once the PFAS leave in our effluent and our biosolids, what happens to them? So this is sampling uh, the Tualatin River. This is sampling soils and groundwater where we land apply our reuse water and the sampling soils where we land apply our biosolids to really kind of make sure we understand and have a good characterization of what is the risk that's coming from our application of PFAS and uh, make sure we have data to defend that. And then the fourth is, you know, I mentioned we're a little behind in Oregon, so we can't do this all alone. We are ahead. We're definitely one of the leaders, but um, we need to bring everybody along. And so we have you know, been teaming, doing a lot of work with Oregon Aqua, the Association of Clean Water Agencies, and talking with the legislatures, the, sorry, members of the legislature, um, and collecting data and sharing our findings, um, producing a white paper and things like that so that we can kind of work together and have these partnerships. And then kind of underlying all of these is this fifth objective, really to make these possible, uh, we really needed to bring the lab in-house. And so Summer will talk more about that. Um, of why we decided to do that and uh, where we are with that. Next so, slide. next slide. Scott, yes. before you go to the next slide, I hope the color coding on all these five objectives is got no internal message. I see red for objective five. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. No, um, I, yeah. I'm trying to take it out on a lighter note that it's just a color coding, it's not a message. Okay. All right, next slide. So I'm not gonna go through everything here, but the point of this slide is kind of what we've been doing on a timeline since we first started this work back in 2019, when uh, Bob, you know, we saw this presentation and Bob said, you know, we ought to go get some PFAS data. And we did a smattering of our industries and started sampling of the treatment plants and took some soil samples where we landed apply biosolids. And since that time, for a couple of years, we were kind of addressing some of the major sources we saw as well as kind of hunting the other ones that we, we didn't know until we found them and did some targeted outreach, as you can see here. Um, really, in the last few years, we've done a lot more. Uh, we've started you know, more regular industrial sampling, really working with those major players. Amanda will talk about some of the, uh, the per, uh, PFAS management plans that we've been working with and uh, putting those into the permitting. Um, the work we've been doing with the landfill, and then on the bottom side, we've been sampling a lot more uh, different types of uh, locations and areas and, you know, soils and the rivers and the creeks, um, groundwater. And then mid uh, last year, we started building our PFAS lab. So you can kind of see how it's really taken off in the last few years as far as some of our PFAS efforts. Next slide. All right. So before I get into the context or the, the results, I did want to kind of put some of this in context. So these things, um, are relevant in terms of regulatory and, and human health conditions at the part per trillion concentration um, for several of the compounds. And so to kind of put that in perspective, there's the you know one drop of water in 20 Olympic size swimming pools. But I like the time one better. That you know a million seconds is 12 days, a billion seconds is 31 years, and humans have we, we haven't had civilization for a trillion seconds yet. Um, and so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, so it's hard. Um, it's we do get detection limits down that low, uh, but it is uh, challenging. Summer can talk about some of the work, and it's it's not a trivial thing to measure these things. Um, but we do a lot of careful QA to make sure the data are reliable. Uh, next slide. All right. So this is looking at the effluent data for some of the most commonly detected PFAS. Uh, it's organized with the shorter chains on the left going to the longer chains on the right. And so our four treatment plants are shown here in the colors. Um, 
And then uh, recent data from uh, the nationwide average of effluents is in gray. And then from that same study, the treatment plants that reported they had no industrial contribution is shown in black. So the good news here is you can see that for most of the compounds, we are well below the national average. Um, for some of the short chains, we are a little above it. And you'll notice that Rock Creek is quite a bit higher than the other three. Um, it has some major contributors that Amanda will talk about and has the most industrial contributions, uh, particularly for those short chain compounds. The other thing to notice on here is PFOA. I don't have a pointer, but if you go to the A chain, the, the green bar from Durham, um, we had pretty high PFOA. We used to have high PFOA at Durham, and Summer will talk, or sorry, Amanda will talk about uh, the work we did to track that down, and we don't have that anymore. Um, so this was kind of, you know, we've been pretty happy with what we've been finding so far. We have a good handle on what uh, kinds of PFAS we have at the treatment plants and in what concentrations, and it's been relatively consistent. Uh, next slide. How do these compare to the acceptable toxicity levels? So right now we don't have any water quality effluent standards for PFAS yet. Um, the drinking water standards is as much as we have right now, or they have some advisory levels for Oregon. Uh, the advisory levels for like PFOS and PFOA are, I think it's 30 nanograms per liter. Bob can maybe confirm that. They are 30. So our effluent probably exceed the drinking water criteria right now. Uh, once it's mixed with the river, we're below drinking water criteria. We are well below what EPA has proposed for the aquatic life criteria in our effluent and in the river. We fully expect that to be reduced by EPA as part of the public comment, but we should still be below it. The big question we don't have as it relates to standards is what's that human health criteria going to be? Yeah, especially when fish consumption is starts taking into account. But yeah, drinking water standard right now for PFOS and PFOA is four nanograms per liter for some context there. Um, but yeah, if we next slide, if we move to the biosolids. So this is similar looking at um, the two most common that the, the end that there were national data for are the PFOS and PFOA. And this is on a log scale, note that, so you can see that we're around, you know, 10 times below the average, which sounds awesome. Uh, but if you look at like what the study they did in Michigan, is this is also a log scale showing all of their treatment plants and the biosolid, uh, the PFAS concentrations in each of those. And you can see that there's a handful of these really industrial impacted ones that are, you know, two orders of magnitude higher than everything else. Um, those are, and even the ones that are like three, four are the ones you hear about in the news when it's, you know, somebody's farm and it's a pulp paper mill at uh, biosolid or something like that. Most of them are down in that orange that, um, you know, like that's why our median is about 13 micrograms per kilogram, but the average is, you know, almost 200. And if you look at our numbers, 13 is right about where we are. So we have pretty normal biosolid concentrations at uh, clean water services. Next slide. All right. So um, there were, we had a lot of data. We don't have time to get through all of it. So we kind of picked some of the most interesting stuff here. This is when we uh, looked at some of our tributaries and the Tualatin River and collected samples of these uh, last summer and then again just recently, but um, we just barely got those data back, so I didn't hear. But this is kind of looking at the bottom is the Tualatin River, looking from upstream on the left to downstream on the right. And then the upper panels are the tributaries and the arrows are showing where those tributaries enter the Tualatin River. So you can see at the top of the Tualatin River up at Cherry Grove, that's, you know, upstream of even where Hag Lake comes in, we're pretty clean. Um, nothing really, some slight detections, um, but no real PFAS to speak of. A little bit on Dairy Creek where you have uh, more of an agricultural contribution. But once we get into the urban area, um, downstream of the effluent and where Rock Creek, uh, the, the creek, enter the Tualatin River, that's when you really start to see the concentrations go up of these ones, uh, these species of uh, PFAS that are here. Um, one of the things that was surprising to us is looking at like Rock Creek and Fano Creek. Um, you know, they're urban creeks. They don't have any effluent contribution to them, but their concentrations are as high or higher than what we're seeing in our effluent. 
And so that's another study we're working on right now um, is working our way upstream up those urban creeks to try to find out what those sources are. Um, and then the other thing to notice here is the uh, like Chicken Creek and Dairy Creek and some of the other ones like at Rue Bridge where there's more of a, a agricultural contribution also kind of had median concentrations. So I don't think the slides in here, but if we look at like the correlation between um, developed area and PFAS is really strong. Uh, it was 0.9 something. Um, and there even is a correlation between agricultural area and PFAS. We don't have any biosolid application in our watershed that we're aware of, not that we do. Um, there are fertilizers and there's history and stuff like that. And these are forever chemicals. Um, so anyway, that's another thing we're, we're researching and gathering more data on right now. Next slide. So um, the other, uh, one of the other things we're working on lately is trying to do mass balances. So, you know, we measure concentrations and that's great. Um, but that doesn't always tell the whole story. You know, what, um, what matters is ultimately what mass is coming to us and mass is the concentration times the volume. And so, for example, you can have a source uh, that has very high concentrations, but hardly any volume. And, you know, it, it gives you medium mass or whatever. Whereas you could have another one that has a lot of volume, but very low concentrations and could give you the same amount of mass. So really understanding where the biggest sources of mass are is really the ones that are going to make the difference for us to be able to move the needle. And so we did a few of these mass balances. Um, Amanda is going to talk about one later. I'm going to talk about the one we did with the Tualatin River and the effluent and the tributaries you can see in the pie chart here. So if we look at um, what this is like uh, near Root Bridge, uh, the blue in the pie is the, what's coming from upstream. And then the gray is what was coming from the creek from Rock Creek as it comes in. This was summer, and so it had a pretty low flow uh, during the time, I think this was June something. And then the rest is coming from our effluent. And so it's clear that in the summer, the effluent is definitely the largest uh, source of mass of PFAS to the Lower Tualatin River. Um, however, that Lower Tualatin River met drinking water standards for all of the PFAS compounds that were there. And so, uh, that was great. The only ones that didn't meet PFAS standards were the urban creeks, uh, which is one of the reasons we're focusing on that. And so that is, you know, you saw that the concentrations in the urban creeks and the effluent were fairly similar. The urban creeks were even a little higher, but the summertime, you know, effluent flow from Rock Creek is, you know, on the order of you know, 25, 30 million gallons per day. Whereas um, in the creek from Rock Creek in the summer is on the order of, you know, two or three. And so anyway, we're collecting data now. We have collected some data around during the wet season because I don't think that this mass balance will hold that same uh, levels uh, in the wet season. Um, but stay tuned on that for more data. Next slide. All right, and then we've been looking at the soils where we land apply our biosolids and at um, a site where we use reuse water, class A reuse water for irrigating uh, an experimental wetland at uh, the Thomas Dairy that's near the Durham plant. And so what we have found uh, is really in the soils, the only thing we really find that's at quantifiable levels is PFOS, and it's even low. It's close to detection limits. Um, in the groundwater, we see a lot more kinds of PFAS, um, but as you can see in the plot, it's just as high in our controls or even higher than it is in the irrigated sites. And so it's not clear that the irrigation is the source of that PFAS in the groundwater. Um, and that was, you know, the other piece is that we don't see the PFAS concentrations change over the course of the irrigation season or the rainy season. And so that doesn't indicate that there's a, a source of mass coming from that that's building up. Um, the other thing is if we compare the speciation of what we see in the groundwater to Fano Creek or to the urban creeks, uh, it looks very similar. And so that's another area of research for us right now is trying to determine the source of uh, those PFAS. We have a few different um, studies going on with that. Um, and then looking at the biosolids in fields, we mostly just see PFAS at very low levels and low as in if you look at the literature for PFAS in soils around the world, even far away from urban areas, you're always in that two nanogram per gram range. And that's about where we are for the most part at the, the plants as well, um, as you can see down here. And yeah, very 
no temporal trends or anything like that. And again, just as high in the control as it is in the irrigated sites. Um, so, yeah, right now there's still a lot more data to collect on this, a lot more to learn, but the data thus far are not saying there's a smoking gun in terms of, you know, no farms are being destroyed by our biosolid application and not even anything close like that. Uh, next slide. All right, so in terms of addressing these, Bob mentioned the treatment technology, you know, we're at water reuse right now. There's all kinds of talks on treatment technology for PFAS and for drinking water. It's really getting there. I think, you know, they've got some good options for drinking water. They're not cheap, but they work. Uh, wastewater has too many other solids and organics and other things in it. Um, none of the technologies that we've seen are anywhere near close to wastewater. So it's, it's not there yet. We may get there someday, um, but it's not there now. So right now, source control is the name of the game. And even if we do get to a place where there is treatment options, there are treatment options that are available and affordable, um, source control is still going to be the most cost effective. And his, it's where EPA has said they're going to focus their efforts as well. And so the source control, what you can do for it depends a lot on the source. So we've been looking at domestic sources, our, our permitted industries, as well as commercial and industrial areas and gathering data to try to understand these. And Amanda is going to talk some more about this, but our primary focus with the industries and with others has been outreach and education, providing education as far as what are, um, you know, PFAS free substitutions of products, um, developing those PFAS minimization or ma management plans that Amanda will talk about. And then where necessary at a few places, there has been active treatment that Amanda will talk about. Um, and that works on industries much better than it does an effluent uh, for a few reasons. For a lot of industries, it's a lot cleaner in terms of the amount of solids and organic material that's in there than the effluent is. And then in the other case, it's a lot more concentrated. And so it becomes much more cost effective, you know, to get a reduction from some of these treatment technologies than it would be for effluent, for example. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Amanda. Thank you, Scott. From our PFAS monitoring efforts, we found that the sources of PFAS really depend on the sewer tip. So for our Rock Creek Water Resource Recovery Facility, the major industrial sources were into our Long Acres and the Hillsborough Landfill. For the Durham Water Resource Recovery Facility, the major sources were analog devices and tectronics. These are metal finishing and a semiconductor hybrid facilities. So these are industrial sources. Our industries are subject to permitting requirements, such as different PFAS mitigation strategies will employ. But domestic and commercial sources, these will really will be the hardest to control. So our main source to mitigate PFAS loading from domestic and commercial sources will be outreach materials. So what we're doing currently is partnering with our community engagement group and starting to develop domestic outreach materials. For next year, we'll also be looking to develop commercial materials as well. So what's our strategy for mitigating industrial sources of, of PFAS? We're implementing PFAS management plans to be required for all industrial users. These are permit requirements. This includes sampling requirements, reporting requirements, and requirements to identify reduction strategies. We do not have any PFAS manufacturers in our jurisdiction, so largely our industries need to look upstream to their own suppliers. Now, the purpose of these PFAS management plans is really twofold. One, they serve as a centralized source for PFAS facility information. Secondly, they serve as a form of industrial outreach. So as we're having these conversations with industries, they could start having their own strategic planning initiatives to begin thinking about what these regulations will be. And this is extremely important. For one of our facilities in Tolerama Acres, they elected PFAS treatment. This is before we required treatment. This is before um, there were any regulations regarding treatment. And I'll get to that on a later slide, what that looks like. So on the left, with Intel Rama Acre implemented treatment and reuse, PFAS concentrations dropped dramatically. And 
rapidly. This is a change that we can see very quickly. Important to note that this treatment system is a high efficiency reverse osmosis treatment system. So something that would be great for a semiconductor industry, but not something at least cost wise is feasible for wastewater treatment facilities at this time. On the right, you see the landfill PFAS concentrations. Now, the Hillsborough Landfills facility where we've had ongoing conversations regarding PFAS since around 2019. They currently have a PFAS management plan that includes source reduction strategies and waste acceptance protocols. They also are employing leachate diversion and stormwater infiltration minimization um, practices to lower leachate volume. Now, what we're seeing is PFAS concentrations over time decreasing. Now, if we're taking a look at our newest December 2023 data, we see PFAS concentrations have dropped quite a bit. However, this is a surprise to us. This, this isn't something we can attribute to uh, PFAS management plan BMPs since um, we don't expect these changes to occur for, for quite some time. So we'll be looking into this data point. Here's a look at one of our successful source control efforts. So on the left to right here, left the black line, what we're seeing is Durham influent. So Durham influent was spiking quite high for PFOA. Each level here in each color corresponds to a sampling site closer and closer to the source, which was identified by the red dot there, the edge of the metal finisher campus. But notice the large PFOA source was identified, but it disappeared. This taught us two things. One, PFAS can be traced through the sewer shed. But two, metal finishers, which are largely job shops, may have varying degrees of and varying concentrations of PFAS, being that they receive a product from various clients, and this may be a source control challenge in the future. What was the source? A metal finisher campus. Here's a look at total PFAS mass broken up by our water resource recovery facilities. Starting at the left, we see Forest Grove and Hillsboro water resource recovery facilities quite low in total PFAS mass, respectively. And this is what we would expect given that Forest Grove and Hillsboro do not receive a large contribution of industrial discharges. Now, alternatively, if we take a look at the Rock Creek facility, which about a quarter of that flow is from industrial discharges, we see when the large semiconductor implemented the treatment system, the drop off. And now, to this day, the most current sample, Rock Creek, April 2023, we're able to see that about a third of the PFAS mass is coming from domestic sources, another third coming from the landfill, and the last third coming from other wet industries. Now, what this really allows us to do is focus our efforts on where it matters most. On the far right, if we look at the Durham facility, take note of the red bar, the semiconductor metal finisher campus that was identified previously. Once that source disappeared, we're seeing a large, almost half of the PFAS mass coming from domestic sources. So we'll need to focus our efforts on outreach material for the Durham facility. Now, if we rewind a minute and take a look at the Rock Creek facility, take note how the landfill decreased by half. So what we're seeing there first is the landfill component disappeared entirely. That was because we had the landfill stop discharging um, for a reason not related to PFAS. It was hydrogen sulfide concerns. But now when the landfill came on at half mass, what we're really seeing there is the river bend landfill leachate being disallowed. So this is an external outside jurisdiction wastewater that was not be discharged at this time. Also important to note that we are having Hillsborough landfill implement treatment by 2025 if they discharge river ventilation to us. It's very nice when you go chronologically what it was. Uh, so earlier you had another point on comparisons and I was trying to look at that. Do you know which year it came from? The biosolid solid comparison. I think, I think it was one of Scott's points. Biosolids comparison. Oh, you're asking like which mass balance came Yeah, from which year was it? Because this has some similar numbers too, but I can't relate them to 
the graph you're showing. Yeah, from ours, that is, those were averages over this whole time period. Oh, I see, okay. And the nationwide data is from 2019 to 2022, circa. Thanks. So we're getting to all solid treatment, lipo leachate shut off. So now I'll hand this over to Summer. Thank you. Awesome. Can y'all can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. The internet's a little sketchy over here. Um, y'all seen this slide already, kind of a little bit in the beginning when Scott was introducing it. Um, but we wanted to reintroduce it again because we have a lot of plans for the future. We have collected a lot of data already, and there's a lot that we continually want to continue to learn about. So we have our quarterly industrial sampling that you just heard Amanda talk about that we will continue to do um, and look at maybe either even more industries as we have PFAS management plans for them. Um, and we also will continue our quarterly influent effluent biosolid sampling that you heard Scott talk about earlier. Um, we will also be doing a lot of um, manholes uh, using utilizing the sanitary sewer system for tracking sources, as you saw in Amanda's, where they were tracking the PFOA peak um, up to the metal finisher campuses. Additionally, we also want to look at our reuse. We want to look at biosolid amended fields and also re reuse amended fields in addition to how that impacts groundwater. Um, so though we want to look at it in the actual field itself, we also want to use controlled experiments to under fully understand in a control setting what is happening, because some fields may have had past impacts from agricultural use or utilizing firefighter phones that we didn't really have control over, which may have already impacted the sites themselves. Additionally, uh, Scott has already shown you some data of rivers and creeks, and we want to continue building this data collection um, because it does affect seasonality. You know, our discharge is a lot less. Um, in the winter when it's very rainy and our discharge is more in the summer. And so we want to understand how that impacts everything in addition to background sources. You know, we have this data where we see, okay, we're nationwide average, but what does that mean for us in Oregon? Um, we want to see our particular sites in, a, um, in comparison to places around us, impacted, non-impacted, so that we can really see where we stand here. Additionally, we have started our PFAS lab, and though I know it shows until 2025, um, this lab is going to be an emerging contaminants lab, and we will be utilizing it for PFAS for analyzing all this data, but we will also be able to utilize this lab to analyze other emerging contaminants and other issues that we would like to look at, um, in addition to other kind of analyses for PFAS. And so all of this data that we're collecting is not just for us. We have a bunch of collaborators uh, that we want to work with. We want to work with EPA, Aqua, and DEQ to also inform them for future uh, regulations. In addition, we want to utilize the data that we have for source control efforts, such as you know, two industries in the PFAS management plans, as well as commercial and domestic outreach. We also want to utilize this to expand our collaborations to universities um, and collaborate more on these um, studies. So even though this slide shows a lot, we have so much more that we also want to do that is not just demonstrated on this slide. Next slide, please. Awesome. And so, you know, we built a PFAS lab and you've seen a bunch of data already of everything that we have collected. But we have so much more that we need to learn to progress ourselves forward. So for ourselves and for other entities. So right now what we are struggling with is that there's very few commercial lab options. This method that we're working with is a very difficult method, in particular because of the, uh, the types of samples that we are using. You know, our influent has a lot of particulates, and in general that makes types of analyses very difficult. And so we've also seen, you know, we've had poor quality assurance for a lot of samples that we've had to throw a lot of data out. And 
usually by the time we send the samples, we don't get our data back for two, three months, which is a very long turnaround time. These labs, there are, since there's such few labs, everyone is sending their samples to them. And so the turnaround time is very slow. Also, these samples are very expensive to run. It's around $550 a sample, not including all the QA samples that we also need to do for every site. Um, so it just is a lot of money and, you know, it kind of made all the sense of the world for us to bring it in house. Our return on investment, you know, we have this figure to the right, we have both the blue and orange line of estimated costs versus updated costs. And this was just estimating for the business case versus what we actually spent in orange. Um, you know, we, we already collected over 700 samples from 2019 to 2023. In 2024 alone, we have over a thousand samples slated to be collected and analyzed. And so, you know, utilizing this, we saw that our return on investment is, you know, within two to three years. And so it allows us to bring it in house and analyze, analyze these samples and answer questions a lot quicker with also fewer QA issues. Um, and this lab, like I said before, is not just for PFAS, it's also for other emerging contaminants. The one that's kind of on the forefront is 6-PPD quinone, which has, it's coming up and has been shown to be really present in stormwater. And that's kind of like the next, this equipment is not just a one trick pony. It can be used for all these different types of analyses. And this type of opportunity of bringing it in-house will also allow us to run samples for other entities, even at water reuse. They're, everyone's always asking us when we're gonna be able to run samples in-house uh, for others. So it allows us to communicate with more people and form these partnerships. And also additionally on the positive side, allows us to also offset some costs, which lowers the ROI a little bit more. Next slide, please. And so kind of where are we right now? Um, so last April, they started talks of, you know, looking at bids, looking at places that they can buy this instrument. And, you know, they purchased the instrument, setup occurred in September, 2023. Um, In-house lab development started in October, 2023, uh, when I joined, where we purchased a bunch of supplies, began starting up the instrument and performing this method on there. We've tested thus far already every different type of sample um, to get kind of preliminary results of where do we stand in uh, comparison to the contract lab. So we've tested influent, effluent, soils, and uh, groundwater, all different types. And so results thus far have been very consistent with previous measurements from the commercial labs, which has been great validation. Uh, so currently what we are targeting is an EPA requirement and we are validating our QAQC um, with EPA and also internally with clean water services. And so our current goal is to have this EPA method in-house for all samples by June 2024. So we're currently chugging away. There's a figure on the bottom that you can kind of see all the, uh, the compounds that we are looking at. Each peak is a different compound on our LC. So I just threw that graphic in. Next slide. And then I'll turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Summer. And oops, thanks everybody on the team. But I think one of the things I wanted to point out about being prepared, you saw what Intel was able to achieve through treatment. One of the great advantages that we had of doing some of the monitoring, trying to understand where the PFOS was coming from, is Intel was at that same time trying to decide what kind of technology they wanted to invest in. It was a much easier exercise working with them to install the uh, high quality uh, reverse osmosis that they put in uh, because it would help solve the problem for us. That probably not what they would have selected had we not been working with them beforehand. It makes a huge difference, you know, if you're telling somebody if you've got to rebuild something they just built, uh, or if you can do it at time. And that is one of the key aspects of our outreach and trying to get started on this earlier. Very similar exercise with the uh, <clears throat> landfill being ahead of the game, and they're starting to work on what the available technology is for landfill treatment as well. We still got a lot of work to do. Uh, you heard Amanda talk about the 
uh, outreach, pollution prevention. You heard Scott talk about that. Many of the industries we are finding, sometimes we hit them, sometimes they don't. We are going to be looking uh, or hiring somebody uh, to fill a position we have open who has a lot of experience in that, which will help us out. And Diane, I think it's a great job, uh, idea for us to come talk about our source control program. But largely, we're trying to get ahead of the game. We talked about regulation. It's coming fast. We're learning about treatment. Uh, it will influence several of our programs and what we can ultimately do through several of our programs. So I think the investment is very worthwhile. Uh, fact is, we're learning a lot. We know a lot more now than we did six months ago and a heck of a lot more now than we did three years ago. And I expect we will continue to learn and continue to learn how to be effective and efficient. Uh, our internal lab is certainly more cost effective. Uh, just to break a little bit, we're coming in on time and under budget, uh, which is never a bad thing. But I think we will get much higher quality data than we would, faster turnaround for influencing our decisions, and it will make us a lot more adept. We can ask questions, Amanda can wonder about the sources she wants to look at, and we can get Amanda answers for that and do so very efficiently. Uh, so I think we're doing real well. One point Scott had made with about seeing more of the uh, smaller change. Remember, we talked about the long change and the smaller change. The regulatory focus has been on the larger change. So what we are seeing is industrial sources move to the smaller chains. Uh, and we'll probably be chasing that for a while as we try to learn what their impacts are, what their toxicity is, and how they move through the environment. So I expect we'll be doing this for a while, but we positioned ourselves very well to be effective. Amanda and her team have demonstrated some uh, remarkable uh, effectiveness so far. Uh, we hope we can continue that. With that, Scott or Summer, anything to add? And I just wanted to give you one, one comment. The team foreshadowed something on the horizon that we will be discussing at CWAC, and it's this chemical known as 6P. 6 ppd quinone it comes from the rubber tires that's getting into stormwater and it's really shown to be in, impacting Puget Sound so so they just foreshadowed something that you'll be hearing more and more about and that one's also sort of a head scratcher because it's it's toxic so but anyway but I'm, I'm sorry Alex you yeah. don't go Last time Diane asked me what the real name of that was, and it's N13 dimethyl butyl N phenol P phenol N diamine or 6 PPG. Quite a chemical. Thank you, Bob. Yes, Anderson. Thank you, Bob, and your entire team. Yeah, was there any questions? Um, I have a few that I think are really quick, I hope. Um, for the Potential for fish consumption. Um, is there going to be, um, I mean, like lead, it's more of a concern with fatty fishes like carp and such. Um, but this is hydrophilic on one end and hydrophobic on the other. So is there any anticipation of whether there will be at some point differential advisories uh. for species? Yeah, that is that's a tremendous question. And what we know now is some of the different uh, specific chemicals behave differently. It's the PFOS that really builds up in fish tissue. So we know it bioaccumulates. What we don't know as well is whether it really biomagnifies, where it builds up as fish eat fish and fish eat fish. So we are just learning that. Uh, but we would expect that there to be some bio or relationship to biomagnification. And I think people are suspecting the higher fatty uh, tissue fish will probably have more because that's part of, uh, you know, what that head will go for, even if the tail does not. But science is still really learning about that. The landfills, Hillsborough and Riverbend, how old are they? Are they both online? They are both lined. They're lined. Uh, yeah, there has been some concern whether there are some leaking from Riverbend or from the uh, yeah Riverbend. I don't know specifically about that. The uh, Riverbend landfill, which is by McMinnville, just off the Yamhill River, 
uh, is closing down. And so they will be capping it. Uh, part of their plan, as Amanda noted, we'll be working with them to figure out where and how they draw well, water. Of course, that. that's how they're generating leachate. They're not capped. That's correct. Got it. I yeah. 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 If you worked with Metro, you wouldn't know one of your landfills would go up and down with the tide, right? No, we don't have that uh, opportunity. Okay. PFOAs. Is that one of the constituents in? At least one of the formulations of a glyphosate product, the Roundup herbicide, is it the same PFOA? I don't know that. It might be interesting to look into because if you've got all these diffuse domestic sources, you know, how many of these could be people going down to Home Depot, getting their can and sorting all their little grasses in their sidewalk cracks? Well, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we're knowing. So, Scott, you know, I have the advantage of being at a computer and can Google. <laughs> um, I had not heard that, but yeah, the PFOA in Roundup is a different compound. It's called polyoxyethylene taloamine. Not the same? It is not the same. It's different. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's PFOA, but it's different. It's PFOA, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I've heard about that in a completely different context. Yeah, as, as Scott okay. noted, there were and some connection with uh, commercial fertilizers and the thought what their formulation of that I don't know is, but if you don't want things to stick, you want it to be slick and slide around, it may well have a was in it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's in it's in the rain. It, it, the Lord, it's very low positive. It's uh, it's yeah, that's a question. You see a question on the screen, and it's be a great time for introduction. We missed uh, your introduction. Or, Hi, sorry, this is Nisha. Um, I'm the at large rep. Um, I had a question, two questions, and feel free to answer this um, offline if uh, everyone wants to go home. Um, but uh, first is, how are you getting industries to change um, their PFAS um, uh, discharge amounts? Because I thought in previous meetings, um, like, Kind of asked a similar question, and uh, the policy of CWAC is to not tell businesses what to do. Um, so, what has changed to get something like Intel to completely overhaul and install RO to change their PFAS discharge? Um, and then, two, um, this, I hope this doesn't come off rude, but just kind of like at what point does the budget of installing an RO, clearly it's very effective um, for CWAC, uh, actually meet the amount that's being spent to have all of the staffing and the research and the labs and, you know, chasing the kind of whack-a-mole approach of every new chemical that we learn is a problem. Um, versus just doing RO and then we have good water. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Nisha. Um, so I'll start first by touching on your question on kind of where is our authority to do this, right? Where is our authority to require these PFAS management plans to require a reduction or reporting or sampling requirements? And that is a federal requirement, 40 CFR 403. As a POTW, we have an approved uh, program for a pretreatment program, which means we're looking at industrial discharges, or we are required to regulate industrial discharges, at least um, that are significant to our POTW, either by category that the EPA has designated uh, for pollutants of concern or through volume. Um, or through our non-domestic waste ordinance, which is our local program. Um, so that's our authority question. And now going to your other question, which was, um, at what point are we going to uh, require treatment? And this is this is a really challenging question, right? And I think a lot of this has to do with the crystal ball that we've all been referencing today. Um, how are we um, preparing for coming regulations? And really, it all starts with outreach. Um, outreach is the cheapest, most effective method. Um, we're starting there and we're starting with looking upstream to suppliers. We're not having 
currently we're not having industries change um, any sort of uh, formulation, but we're having them identify reasonable reduction strategies. So example for Intel, um, the uh, photolithography process for wafer manufacturing um, is very rich in PFAS. Um, it essentially has no uh, counterpart, no interchangeable chemical that can be used, but they're identifying a detergent that they use that has PFAS that can be replaced. So it won't be all chemicals that can be replaced, but there are a few that can be. Um, another method here and a cheaper method than requiring treatment is segregation of waste streams. So if treatment is not feasible, if alternatives are not feasible, you can only segregate those waste streams and haul them off site in the event it comes to that. Thank you, Jaffa. Yeah, I would just to summarize that uh, what we are dealing with the uh, uh, management plans for the PFOS is really having the industry understand what they are discharging to us and take a self-reflection on what they can do about it. At this point, we haven't established limits. We haven't established limits because EPA has not established limits for us. Once there are limits established by EPA, we will go through our calculations to decide if we need to put limits on some uh, or all or which industries that may have a, a pretreatment limit on them. As I pointed out, EPA may also be developing technology-based limits for some industries. I don't know that that will really influence us, but at this time, we are not telling somebody what they need to do for treatment or when they need to do the treatment. The entities that have elected to do that have elected to do that for their own reason. Our outreach is to make sure they know these things are coming and they are deciding what is in their best interest of what to do at this time. We want to make sure that if they elect to do something, it also will ultimately work for us. Uh, but I think that's just part of our outreach. As far as where they go to, uh, you know, the cost and level of uh, reverse osmosis, uh, that's going to work for some industries. Uh, it's not going to work for other industries. You have to have pretty good cash flow for that. And Rick, what would it cost us to do reverse osmosis at Rock Creek? Most of 100 million, I would say. So we are not there yet. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, and then there's the the annual costs, um, you know, the power requirements to do RO are enormous. Um, and you can't do it on the secondary effluent. We'd have to put several other treatment processes before you could even do RO. And so, yeah, our, our costs of this, our research and outreach are a drop in the bucket of what it would cost us if we actually had to put RO on our effluent. I think so. I want to make sure we answered your question. I think we rambled a little bit there. All right. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. At this time, we want to open for a public comment. Do we have any? Stephanie? Sure, Ken. We do not have any members of the public, although we do have one caller who's joined our meeting in progress tonight, and I am not certain who that is. I think that's Summer. It totally is. I wanted to make sure my speaker wasn't going to go out, so I put on the phone just in case. So I have to echo earlier. <laughs> we have no members of the public uh, either in the room or on the line screen. Thank you, Stephanie. With that, Joe, could you help us with announcements? Yes, and I'll try to be fast because I know we've gone a little longer than normal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. Um, three quick announcements. Next month's meeting is back on April 10th. We will not have a meeting in May because we'll have a budget committee process. Uh, so uh, get the month of May off if you're not on the budget committee. Wanted to give an update on the new chief of staff. We have selected a new chief of staff. That individual um, will not be joining us until May. Uh, she uh, works for a organization that uh, she was down in Salem uh, for most of the so sh short session, uh, very active, had to focus there. Uh, she needs to give her employer uh, notice and some time for transition. She'll sh look for her name soon. She'll be joining us in May. 
we're very, very excited uh, to have her join us. And then also on CWEC, there's two vacancies. I wanted to give an update. Uh, district 3, which was Michael Phillips district, uh, Terry Song actually reached out to us and said, hey, I live in District 3. Can I rejoin CWAC as a possibility? And we were very excited because uh, the only reason he stepped down is because he had retired from his business and wasn't eligible. Uh, so we are recommending uh, to the board that Terry be appointed for District 3. And then we had the Business 1 rep, which was Terry's position open up a few months ago and we have someone ashley farrell is her name she's an environmental engineer at intel specializing in wastewater compliance and treatment and she's being recommended to the board to join as uh, a business rep so the board will consider those recommendations on april 2nd and would they be here as fast as april 10th i don't know if, if, worked we, out if we can get them here yeah that'd so, be great so you have two new uh see what members on that Horizon. So that's all. Thank you very much. And with that, I adjourn our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.